Hi, Michael. How are you? I think your mic is muted. There we go. How's Mexico? Oh, it's great. It's a gray afternoon here in Mexico City. It's 90 degrees Celsius and overcast, while in New York it's 23 Celsius and, and pretty cloudy, right? Yeah, but we're not complaining. We're not complaining. <laughs> Listen, it's incredible. It's our seventh program. Wow. But it's too late for me. You know, this is way past my bedtime. <laughs> no, come on. New York City is a city that never sleeps. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and believe me, we're going to have a very good program for everybody listening in Mexico and across our borders. And we have a very special program because Michael and I are always teasing each other about uh, evidence-based and eminence-based, right? Uh, guess who is who? <laughs> no, I, I declare myself that I don't understand science. Uh, you know, I appreciate very much what you do, researchers, people who publish. But I think it's it's time that we make this with a, in in an easier way, don't you think? So so people like me can understand. Even people like me can understand. Oh, don't don't sell yourself short, honey. Uh, <laughs> you are you understand it very well, and you and but I tell you what, I really appreciate you creating this forum here to have this discussion. It's very important, I think, and I think uh, the audience and the listeners are going to benefit greatly from hearing this today. Yeah, especially today that we're going to have two very important topics, right? One, one is the one I just said, you know, it's evidence-based versus eminence-based, which, right. uh, which means, you know, people that understand research and can apply it for the benefit of their patients and people who understand the, the practice, the clinical practice of dentistry. And the second part is going to be, we have invited one of the foremost researchers in the area of saliva and salivary research to help us understand a little bit where we're going to be, where we are today and where we're going to be when it comes to saliva and the relevance to dentistry in the future. So it's, uh, it's going to be very exciting. We're going to see a short video. Remember that everybody who appears in this program, we do it pro bono. We don't get any honorarium, but we need uh, money for the cost of the production, which is in different cities through Mexico and the United States. So here's a video, a short video, and we'll be right back. Observa el estado de la salud de la cavidad bucal mediante la detección de actividad bacteriana de una forma más clara, sin la necesidad de utilizar agentes externos. Visualiza placa dentobacteriana activa y no activa, microfracturas, filtración de restauraciones, caries, desmineralización, valoración de estado periodontal, Valoración de prótesis dentales, zonas retentivas de placa dentobacteriana, auxiliar visual para el paciente. Funciona a través de la tecnología QLF que incide la fluorescencia sobre uno de los elementos residuos de las bacterias. La porfirina que se revelará en el filtro de la pantalla, marcando un color más rojizo, dependiendo de la cantidad de porfirina presente, lo que diferenciará la placa nueva de la placa vieja, así como las zonas de gran actividad bacteriana. Encuentra esta poderosa herramienta para llevar a cabo todas tus mejores ideas dentales. Okay, so here are our two guests. I'll let you introduce our guest from the States, Michael. Sure, so uh, Professor Stefan Ruhl, uh, his research uh, is aimed to elucidate the molecular mechanism of glycan-mediated microbial adhesion to salivary proteins from an evolutionary perspective with the goal of using this insight for diagnosis and prevention of dental or systemic disease. He is the past president of the Salivary Research Group within IADR, the International Association of Dental Research, and in 2015, he 
He was named IBR Salivary Researcher of the Year. And in 2020, he received the IDR Distinguished Scientist Award in Salivary Research. So you understand why we are, we are uh, delighted to have Stefan come and talk to us about saliva. Just a little bit more about his background. Uh, he obtained his DDS, his dental degree in 1984, and then a PhD in immunology in 1988 from uh, Göttingen in Germany. And then he continued his postdoctoral studies at the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, NIH. And he served as professor of operative dentistry and periodontology at the University of Regensburg, in Germany. And for the past 13 years, he, or 13 years ago, he joined the Department of Oral Biology at the University at Buffalo. And there he devoted the rest of professional life to the study of oral sciences. So we are delighted that Stefan was willing, able, and had the time to come here and share his insights with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, I have the pleasure to introduce a, a very well-known dentist in Mexico. He's a, a periodontist. He's a good friend of the Mexican Dental Association, where he has had some uh, parts in the uh, as a secretary for the for international as well as uh, the continuing education program of the Mexican Dental Association. Dr. Luis Karakowski is Certificate Pediatric Dentistry at the University of Pittsburgh. Then he has a Master of Dental Science also from the University of Pittsburgh. A long time ago, Luis, Program Director, Graduate Pediatric Dentistry, Universidad Tecnológica de México, Mexico City from 2012 to up to date. Past President of the Mexican Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, and cum laude award from the Mexican Dental Association for, con for continuing education in 2005. To all of our audience in the States, I want to let you know that the Universidad Tecnológica de México, uh, the name in Spanish is Unitec, which has nothing to do with Unitec, the company, the dental company. So if you see Unitec, it's not, a, mm -hmm. a, it's not about a company, it's about a university. My alma mater as well. Hello, Luis, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi, Meg, how are you, Mike? Hello. Okay, so now we're gonna go with uh, your presentation, Luis, so the floor okay. is yours. Okay. okay, so good night, thanks for Jaime for inviting me. Um, he told me when he invited me, he wanted me to, to talk about the uh, evidence base against uh, eminence base. I'm not a researcher, but I'm a clinician that works strictly on, on everything that is scientifically founded. So I decided to speak about a topic that is uh, uh, well known for most of us, but it has changed. It changed so much that if we don't do exactly what we have to do, the procedures that we are doing, they will fail. Inevitably, they will fail. So we will divide the lecture in two parts. First, to understand dental caries. And then after that, uh, how we are managing in the modern uh, way this same dental care. Next slide, please. Yeah, so let's start with understanding dental caries based on dental uh, dental evidence. Okay, next please. Um, we remember in the 60s, uh, Dr. Case uh, was one of the first ones that told us that uh, dental caries was uh, extremely infectious and basically it was a bacterial disease. Next please. But now, uh, recently, this has changed. And if we are uh, learning now that caries is not a classical infectious disease, everything changed for us because we have to change the approach to manage uh, correctly the disease. Next, please. When we see this uh, chart uh, to solve the etiology of dental caries, we can see exactly the difference between an infectious disease and a non-infectious disease like caries. 
uh, caries is already uh, known as it, as uh, does uh, dysbiosis. So uh, in an infectious disease, we see that single species is the responsible to create the, the etiology for the disease. In caries, we have many uh, bacterial uh, species that are responsible for it. And they live all together in the mouth. And when something goes wrong, we have an, this uh, an equilibrium goes uh, to the other side, and we start to feel that. When we have an infectious disease, we are for sure non-healthy. We are, when we have caries, we can walk on the street, we can teach to our uh, students, and we can be uh, with the disease. So it's a very diff different disease. And one of the main differences between the two uh, diseases here is that in caries, we don't transmit the disease from person to person. And we, when we started to listen to this, uh, we have to change everything that we have learned from school. So what we are trying to do now, it's changing the equilibrium inside the map. The next, please. Who could have believed that bacteria in the mouth is the responsible entity to have health in the mouth? But we have to be very careful to which bacteria we are talking about. Next, please. When we see, uh, when we read this uh, important article, we uh, have a more clear image that bacteria in good uh, equilibrium will be benefit, uh, will benefit for our um, health in the mouth. Everything goes bad when the bad bacteria works in a better way, way than, the, uh, than the good bacteria. So when we check this, the next please, next, next, we can see that the World Health Organization had to change completely the definition of dental cares. And this happened two and a half years ago. And they just added three small uh, letters. Before October 2017, the WHO uh, uh, was defining dental caries as the most common communicable disease worldwide. But when they added this non-communicable, everything, everything changed for us. What we are learning now is that the behavior in the patient is the responsible for um, having a, no, a, a balance going to the other way. So now we are considering that free sugars are the essential factor in the development of dental caries, not bacteria. Bacteria is important in the caries process, but it's not the origin to develop the disease. The next, please. Now we are for sure uh, learn that sugar and bad oral hygiene are the main drivers of caries related dysbiosis. So probably we were barking to the wrong tree. So everything that we, all the efforts that we were doing before probably were not enough uh, to, to get a good, good balance in our mouth. The next, please. So the definition has changed. In 2019, a very important group of cariologists got together and they had an 100% uh, accordance to have a good definition of dental cares. It's not an easy definition because in no, it's not an easy uh, disease to treat. The real definition is that dental caries is a biofilm mediated, diet modulated, multifactorial, non-communicable, dynamic disease resulting in net mineral loss of dental heart tissues. So when we see the next part, that it's, it is determined by biological, behavioral, psychological, and environmental factors, we can see that we can change 
the, the style, the lifestyle of our patients. And we, and we, and we can achieve that. We can have good results in the treatment we, we are doing. The next, please. This is something that changed for complete the way we pediatric dentists treat our patients because we learned before that there was a window of infectivity that mothers, uh, they um, transmit the disease to their children. But we are now sure that mom, uh, the moms can transmit the bacteria, but not the disease. So now uh, we are, we know that the patient has to have a good balance in their, in their mouth. So uh, they can go to the good size of, uh, to the good side of the equation. The next please. So let's understand what disease and what the lesion means. Next. Now we know that caries is a complex disease, but the caries lesion is only the symptom of the disease. It's exactly what happens in chickenpox. In chickenpox, the blisters are the symptoms, not the disease itself. Next, please. We grew up with the surgical model of treatment. That was the way we uh, learned in our uh, school, even in graduate school. And we had to uh, be prepared to make a perfect geometrically cavity and then place a good material inside the cavity. And this was a big mistake because we started what we call the molar cycle of the tooth. Every time we do a drill and fill restoration, every time the patient comes, sometimes we have to repeat and do a greater uh, restoration. So it's not the best way to do dentistry. Next, please. Also, it's important to learn from Nigel Pitt's iceberg model, and that's the way we learn dentistry. Only the part that it's above the surface of the water, that's what we call caries before. Only that uh, what was detectable clinically for us with our eyes, that was uh, right in the chart that was caries. But everything that was not detectable but by our eyes, but it was a loss of minerals. We didn't consider care, so we didn't treat that. Next, please. Any disease like dental caries has to have a causative factor. It has to have risk factors. And um, also we have to do like we do in another uh, diseases. We have to treat the patient and we have to treat the tooth. If we only treat the tooth like we, that we used to do before, we will fail with our, with our restoration we, because we know that every restoration has a time limit. Next, please. So what's the disease etiology, the theory most accepted right now? Next, please. For sure, it's by, uh, the uh, theory by Dr. Marsh, what we call the ecological plaque hypothesis. And if we see in close detail, what does it mean? It means that we can, if we have a good partner in front of us, we can change the way he lives and we can improve the balance inside the mouth. We are talking about cardiogenic diet, about um, health habits. And if we can change that, we can have a better prognosis on what we are doing. Next, please. Also, as we mentioned, dental caries has very uh, 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 risk factors that we can uh, detect very easily. Next. So uh, right now, if we can consider that we have risk factors in this, uh, in this uh, disease, we can consider ourselves real medicals. Next, please, because it's a disease. And we base this on the carious balance by Dr. Featherstone. Next. And what this means is that in the mouth, 
we can have a protective factors and pathologic factors. And we have to uh, be aware that protective factors have to be uh, very well implemented in our patient's mouth. Uh, pathological factors for sure can be changed in the lifestyle of our patients. Next, please. Later, he included in this uh, carrier's balance what we call the disease indicators. And disease indicators are like what we see in this mouth, white spot lesions, radiographic lesions, visible cavitations, gingivitis, and a cavity within the last three years. Next, please. And these are the disease indicators inside the carrier's balance chart. Next, please. And the second part is the man manage uh, the dental caries. Next, please. And we manage dental caries based on five principles, the five principles of, of minimal intervention dentistry. Next, please. So we are doing a twofold when we manage dental caries. The modern management of dental caries based on what we know now and all the principles of minimal invasive treatment. Next, please. Uh, what type of uh, uh, dentist we are when we see these four situations? Uh, the most important thing is that we have to be the most conservative dentist as we can. Next, please. So the modern management of dental caries deals with understanding the dental caries as a complex uh, disease process. Next and also dealing with an individual. Every individual has different uh, type of problems. Next, please. And second, the minimal invasive dentistry is like a philosophy, a way of, live, of life, and it involves those techniques that respect the health and function of oral tissues and prevent the disease from occurring and um, intercept its program with minimal tissue loss. And finally, Minimally invasive dentistry doesn't mean small. It just means that we have to be very conservative in the way of removing healthy uh, dental tissue. Okay. Ready. Thank you, Luis. Um, well, Michael, what did you think? That was great. Um, it was uh, really uh, a pleasure to listen to you, Luis. Thank you very much. I think Thanks. you have a very, uh, very sound, um, very scientific approach to a disease that is, as you mentioned, the most common non-communicable disease in the world, especially among children, by the way. Uh, and uh, I think we have to do something differently. I, I don't think we can be proud of this being the number one chronic disease among children. But there's something we're doing wrong, and I think you have uh, elucidated some of the issues that we need to pay attention to that we haven't done previously. But I'm going to be very interested to hear what the audience have to say and to ask you about as well, by the way, when we get to the question and answer uh, session. But thank you very much. Well, thank you, Michael. And again, we're going to go to a short video, and then I'll let you introduce Stefan's presentation. OrtoGuard es una línea completa especializada para quienes usan aparatos de ortodoncia. Cuenta con tres productos de uso diario que ayudan a prevenir las lesiones de mancha blanca en los dientes. El enjuague bucal especializado Colgate OrtoGuard, con una fórmula revolucionaria en el segmento de los enjuagues bucales, le proporciona a los consumidores una efectividad terapéutica en el tratamiento ortodóntico y en pacientes de alto riesgo de caries. Llegamos a los espacios irregulares generados por la adhesión de la resina y el bracket, previniendo la desmineralización del esmalte 
hasta un 58%. Libre de alcohol, sabor agradable y de uso diario en personas de 6 años en adelante. El nuevo gel dental especializado Colgate OrthoGuard con 5000 partes por millón de fluoruro de sodio, ideal para personas en tratamiento de ortodoncia y o con alto riesgo de caries. Revierte tres veces más las lesiones de caries inicial y proporciona hasta 40% mayor reducción de caries contra una crema dental regular con fluoruro. Es seguro y se recomienda usarlo diariamente una vez al día durante el tratamiento ortodóntico, indicado para personas de 6 años en adelante. Durante el tratamiento de ortodoncia, los cuidados de salud bucal exigen mayor atención. Los brackets y alambres ortodónticos pueden impedir una buena higiene bucal. Por eso Colgate ha creado el cepillo dental especializado Colgate OrthoGuard, con cerdas multinivel indicado para quienes usan aparatos ortodónticos. Gracias a su forma en U, cubre toda la superficie del bracket, mejorando el efecto de limpieza en la encía, dientes, alambres y brackets. Las cerdas externas en forma de espiral eliminan la placa dental en la línea de la encía, proporcionando así una mejor sensación de limpieza en los tejidos bucales. Y a su vez, las cerdas internas auxilian en la limpieza alrededor de los brackets y alambres ortodónticos, sus puntas de 0.01 milímetros pueden limpiar pequeños espacios, proporcionando una mejor limpieza de la superficie de los brackets y alambres. Colgate, siempre a la vanguardia del cuidado bucal, presentó Colgate Guard, la ciencia detrás de tu sonrisa. Great, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, Stefan, um, what can you tell us about saliva? Where are we today? Where are we going? Is this something we should pay attention to? How can saliva make us into better healthcare professionals? Yeah, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Jaime, for um, letting me speak today about saliva, which is my favorite topic, by the way. Um, so, buena noches to everybody, um, to the audience. Um, but sometimes when I say saliva is my favorite topic, I feel like I'm pretty much alone because saliva doesn't have a very good reputation in the public. Um, it is considered as something disgusting. We don't like to see saliva or spit, and we don't like to touch it. And we as dentists also don't seem to be very much in favor of saliva because it constantly um, messes up our field of operation in the oral cavity, which we like to have dry. And then here comes saliva and swamps everything. So overall, um, we have to do something to improve the image of saliva in the public. And perhaps we can do this by pointing out that it is extremely important for oral health. So can I have the first slide, please? So an, a healthy oral cavity is not possible without having saliva being present. Um, and this becomes evident already in children. So every mother knows that when the first teeth break through, the children experience a real flush of salivary drooling, which is probably be put there by nature to keep the teeth healthy and well mineralized, and also to keep the oral cavity healthy and to allow the, chil the child to eat solid food. So could I have the next slide, please? But what happens when things go wrong? So when saliva is missing or when its composition is not as it should be. And there are several cases that we can see and experience in our dental practice. One is when patients have been irradiated therapeutically for a tumor in the head and neck region. Sometimes the salivary glands happen to be in the field of irradiation and also get collateral damage. And that causes um, the salivary gland tissue to degenerate. And so the salivary glands produce less saliva and a saliva of a different composition. And that initially causes in these patients a lot of problems that they immediately perceive. They have problems um, swallowing they have problems chewing, they do not taste very well their food anymore, um, their mouth is dry, they cannot speak very well, 
um, they cannot sing, and but what happens later and what is not immediately realized is that the dentition deteriorates, and this is visible here in this slide. So these teeth have almost lost. Let's go to the previous one. These teeth have almost lost the enamel layer, except for one of the teeth, and I think you as dentists will immediately um, notice that this is a ceramic crown that a dentist has put with it, which turns out to be the only tooth that really survives here in good shape. So could I go to the next slide, please? So here is another um, clinical situation that we sometimes encounter in our dental practice, but that we in many cases do not um, diagnose early enough. And that is a Sjögren syndrome. And Michael can tell you later how it's correctly pronounced in, um, in the Swedish language. So also in Sjögren syndrome, which is an autoimmune disease, the salivary glands um, are damaged and these these patients suffer from oral dryness and um, in this picture you can see that the teeth also have lost the enamel layer it's demineralized and what is left what you can see and what you might think might be remainders of enamel are actually composite filling cervical composite fillings that a dentist has placed in the early stages of this disease where he or she probably didn't realize that this patient had Sjögren syndrome. So at that time point, if this dentist had um, realized that this patient has a problem and had sent him to an internal uh, medicine colleague, um, he could have probably saved a lot of damage, but that was too late. So next slide, please. So from what is lacking in these patients when they don't have saliva, and maybe we can um, zoom into this slide a little bit, um, what is lacking in the patients when saliva is, is missing um, brings us to the functions that saliva has under physiological uh, conditions, so the so-called beneficial functions of saliva. And those are important for the teeth, of course, so for protection against demineralization of the enamel layer, helping with constant remineralization of teeth and keeping the mouth well lubricated. Um, saliva is also important, of course, and this is maybe the primordial function for the um, management of food in the oral cavity. So for chewing, swallowing, and for enzymatic predigestion of food in the mouth. And then lastly, saliva is important to defend us against um, bacterial invaders. So saliva has antibacterial components, antifungal components, so the oral cavity would be a perfect breeding place for fungi, but a healthy oral cavity doesn't have very many of those. So there are antifungal components in there, and there are also antiviral components in there. So... Um, and all these functions are being um, executed by a great number of components um, that are called proteins. So we have many, many proteins in saliva that act to execute these functions. And um, let's go to the next slide. To simplify things a little bit, there are two major functions of saliva. One is to protect the oral cavity, to protect the teeth, and also to protect the upper uh, gastrointestinal tract. So you have to imagine we are also swallowing a liter of saliva per day about, and it goes down the esophagus and into the stomach. And then saliva is important for the digestive part. So for us being able to pre-process and pre-digest food to be able to swallow it. So looking at these functions, one would think saliva would be an ideal fluid for diagnostic purposes. And let's go to the next slide, please. And this was the hope um, maybe 10 or so years ago or a little longer ago um, when saliva came into fashion as a non-invasive diagnostic fluid with great hopes for dentistry. Let's go to the next slide. And indeed, um, the promise was kept. Um, so saliva is um, a window 
to the body's health situation. Um, it is in part a filtrate of blood plasma. So many components that we have in our blood will appear in saliva at some stage, maybe at lower concentrations, but they are there. And the great advantage of saliva is that it is easy to sample. It's fast. It doesn't hurt. You don't have to stitch anybody. It's non-invasive. It's inexpensive. You don't need a specialist and it can be done any place, including on airports or in other public places. And so it would be a perfect point of care diagnostic fluid. And particularly in the times as we have them nowadays where infectious agents like the new COVID virus um, are on our in our daily news, um, a saliva test would be great to have. Um, it would be perfect. So let's go to the next slide. And all these efforts have led to um, a lot of applications of saliva um, to measure various biomarkers and various markers of health. So we can measure um, ions, electrolytes, we can measure antibodies, which is important for um, diagnosis of infectious disease. We can measure cytokines, hormones, nucleic acids, and we can also find drugs, metabolites, and toxins in saliva. And the latter is very important for um, criminalistic purposes and for forensic medicine. And the detection of nucleic acids is very important nowadays because there are already saliva tests being developed for the early diagnosis of uh, COVID virus infection. So there is already a lot of literature out there on a new saliva test, which will probably hit the market very soon. So let's go to the next slide. But what about dentistry? All the uh, advantages of salivary diagnostic tests so far um, concerned medical applications. Um, what about us dentists? Is saliva a diagnostic fluid for the dental practice? And the disappointing um, answer, at least right now currently, is that saliva is of little prognostic value, at least the way we are using it right now. So the only thing we can really measure is the salivary flow rate. And so when the salivary flow rate gets under a certain threshold, and for stimulated salivary flow rate, this is about 0 0.7 milliliters per minute, then we can talk about a dry mouth. And if it goes below 0 0.2 milliliters per minute, it is a classical xerostomia. And with that come all the problems for dental disease. But that's about it. And connected to this is buffer cap capacity. So that's another thing we can mention. But buffer capacity and salivary flow rate go hand in hand. Lastly, we have microbiological assays, but their prediction value is not very high. So overall, um, we are hoping for a better diagnosis of um, saliva. And let's go to the next slide. Um, and the hopes are actually great because there is a lot more in saliva than what we so far have paid attention to. And most of the diagnostic biomarkers that we know nowadays are actually in very, very low amounts in our saliva. So they are not even visible on the diagram that I'm showing you here on the slide. Could you zoom in a little bit? So what we have here are the 20 most abundant components um, that we have in saliva. Could we enlarge this a little bit? Um, and none of these 20 highest abundant components in saliva have been identified as diagnostic markers, yet they are so important to keep the mouth healthy in many different aspects. So there is great hope if we concentrate on these markers that we eventually might, might find something that is related to dental caries or to periodontal disease. Um, and let's go to the next slide. And what is particularly interesting is that many of these high abundant salivary proteins have important functions in interacting with the bacteria and microbes in the oral cavity. They um, keep a balance between 
the healthy microbes and the pathogenic microbes. So between the good and the bad, as is shown in this cartoon, there are happy ones and then there are kind of mean ones that are probably causing trouble. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so we can um, expand this initial yin and yang diagram with another yin and yang diagram around. So it's not only protection and digestion, it is also interaction with the microbiota and the oral cavity. On the one hand, with the good bacteria that we call commensal bacteria, the ones that we have in our mouth and that keep a balance in the oral cavity. Um, and um, on the other hand, pathogens that um, try to infect us, that get through our mouth, uh, use our mouth as a port of entry into the body's interior. And saliva defends us against this. Now let's go to the next slide. And this is actually where my research area comes in, and I will only very superficially talk about that, but we have basically um, salivary proteins that coat all the surfaces in the oral cavity. So they coat the tooth, which is symbolized here on the left-hand side, and they also coat the gingiva and the oral epithelia. And once these salivary proteins are forming a film on these surfaces, only then can oral bacteria attach um, using their adhesin molecules on their surfaces with which they um, recognize certain counter receptors in the salivary proteins. And in that regard, glycans. Glycans are sugars that are decorating the salivary proteins. Glycans are very important in that process of bacterial adhesion. So bacteria can adhere to the tooth, as is shown on the upper left. Bacteria can adhere to the gingiva and to the epithelia, as is shown on the bottom. And bacteria can attach to each other and thereby lead to the formation of um, multi-species oral biofilms that we call dental plaque. And then um, bacteria can also form aggregates in solution which leads to their agglutination and eventually clearance from the oral cavity. And lastly, bacteria can be destroyed by phagocytic cells that come from the gingival curricular fluid and can kill the bacteria. So let's go to the last slide. So our hope is that if we understand the interactions between saliva and the oral bacteria, we will be able to pinpoint on certain molecules that will have a diagnostic potential as markers or predictors of oral disease. Also, there might be a potential for therapy because once we know the molecular basis of these interactions, we may be able to custom design inhibitor molecules that we could add to a mouthwash or to a toothpaste and try to inhibit um, the adhesion of unwanted bacteria um, to the surfaces in the oral cavity, to the surfaces of the tooth and to the surfaces of the periodontium. So that is our, our hope and that is what keeps my research going. And um, I like to say thank you with my last slide um, that shows um, Niagara Falls, which is very close to Buffalo, where the University of Buffalo is. And if you want to contact me, you can see my website there, you can see my email, and you also can contact me over social media, and down there is my Twitter address. So thank you very much. Really great. Thank you very much, Stefan. That was fantastic. Um, I have a quick question for you. It seemed like, and might be, um, I might be mistaken, but it seems like saliva can give us a yes and no answer, presence or absence. Can it give us more quantitative type of information as well? Um, for instance, let's say diabetes. Could it give me an indication uh, the level of plasma glucose that I can then measure in saliva and get the measurements of it, can it be quantified or is it just present or absence? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think it depends what you are measuring. So um, if you measure the presence or absence of a um, of a virus, let's just take the COVID virus because everybody is interested in that. It's enough to know, yes, it's there or it's not there, right? Um, but there are other metabolic markers, like as you mentioned for diabetes or for other systemic diseases, there might be two more markers in saliva also, or there might be early signs of a um, of heart disease. Um, for those, of course, it would be very important to uh, measure um, different levels. And um, that is actually also possible. And there are already miniature devices under development that will be inserted into the oral cavity. They can actually be put permanently there, be um, glued onto the surface of a tooth or surface of a prosthetic device, and they could serve as intraoral monitors um, in patients that have a problem. So that would be perfect, like in patients who are hospitalized or who have a certain um, metabolic disease so that they can, you can then maybe connect it to your cell phone and get immediate uh, readout of um, your glucose level or something else. Let, before we go any further, we have to go to a video and then we'll, we'll start a debate among us. So please. Thank you. Protege a tu clínica y a tus pacientes. Conoce la fórmula de O radical de amplio espectro como desinfectante orgánico de superoxidación que elimina bacterias, virus y hongos desinfectando superficies. Desinfecta tu consultorio, equipo, sillones, instrumental quirúrgico, rotatorios y cucharillas. Además, no mancha y no guarda olor. Protégete y protégeme. O Radical, el mejor amigo en tu consultorio. Okay. Well, I think that the both both subjects were really connected, don't you think, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, there's a lot of connectivity here when it comes to bacteria, the the survival bacteria in this very complicated fluid we call saliva, and obviously the adhesion or bacteria eventually will cause um, caries or the lack of saliva. And I love the whole yin yang thing that uh, Stefan talked about, how it can both destroy and protect, obviously. Uh, I'm very curious to hear what the listeners have to uh, have to say about this stuff and what questions they have. Yeah. Well, before we go to questions, uh, Stefan, I have a question. This is mine. <laughs> what about xylitol? Oh, yeah. I was hoping that Michael would teach us how to pronounce Sjögren's syndrome correctly. But yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe he can do that later. Uh, uh, xylitol is a, um, um, is a natural type of a sugar that's being originally uh, was distilled from birch trees, also in the Scandinavian countries originally, by the way because they have lots of birch trees and under the bark of these trees um, is uh, xylitol. And it turned out that this tastes like sugar, but it doesn't taste as good as sugar. So you still cannot make like a good tasty chocolate or any good candies with xylitol. However, it's being used as a sugar substitute in many um, instances and um, some um, um, sugary products uh, that children like to consume um, are being produced with xylitol and xylitol, xylitol is less cariogenic. Um, it's almost also inhibitory um, for the bacterium, the main culprit that causes dental caries, which is a streptococcus mutans. So um, Previous work has shown this, that xylitol inhibits the metabolism of this bacterium. The only problem is if we consumed xylitol in amounts great enough to really inhibit the carious bacteria, it will cause problems because it causes diarrhea. So using xylitol excessively is probably not a good idea. 
So it is helpful, yes, it is better than sugar if you have chewing gum or if you eat some sweet xylitol, certainly is good. But as a carious um, uh, therapeutic agent, um, my opinion is that it is not of such great use. Uh, by the way, maybe that, I didn't, I didn't uh, read the uh, uh, question, uh, but what also, about uh, the uh, interaction uh, with saliva? For example, in some, natu in some stores for natural medicine, they ha they've had for years uh, drop nose, uh, um, nose drops made of xylitol because they say that is the, it disorganizes the, the, the colonies of bacteria. And number two, in oh. other people, you know, Dr. Featherstone was here a couple of weeks ago and he said no, but still a lot of people insist that you can uh, make uh, the salivary glands produce more saliva when you introduce xylitol into the mouth. It can be a patch of, uh, uh, that you can put in, the, uh, in your cheek and it dissolves easily or drops mm. or sprays, mm -hmm. like biokin, for example. Yeah, be the most common. Is it is it true? You you're an expert in saliva, so I'm asking the. <laughs> uh, the right so person. almost anything that you eat will increase your salivary flow. And this is basically made by nature as such. Um, but in a healthy person. All of us, uh, as long as we're healthy, we have enough salivary flow. We don't need to worry. So we don't need xylitol to make it any better. It doesn't make any better. It doesn't make it any worse. Um, the problem is in patients, in those rare patients who have a dry mouth or who suffer from xerostomia, for those mostly um, the greatest help is probably chewing activity because simply through the mechanical activity of chewing, and through the peri uh, activation of the periodontal receptors, the salivary glands get stimulated and produce more saliva. So probably just simply chewing chewy gum, chewing gum, of course not sugar containing, but perhaps some um, sugar substitute and maybe xylitol is not a bad choice, would be what I would recommend. Um, xylitol itself to solve um, xerostomia, I, I'm not... Uh, very convinced about that, to say that. Okay. Uh, just, <clears throat> just one quick one here. Um, and, uh, Stefan, you can comment. But uh, remember one more thing about xylitol. It's very, very dangerous for animals to eat xylitol, dogs or even cats. <clears throat> even small amount of xylitol can, can actually kill a dog or a cat. Yeah. So you have, if you have anything that with xylitol in it, don't give it to your pets. Yeah, so that's what I always say to my students when I teach cardiology. I see, I say, you know, um, you would never give this to a horse, a cat, or a dog, but you give it to your own children. Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, Luis, there is a question for you. Unless, Michael, you have one, because no, we ahead, see another video before we go to the audience questions. Please go ahead. Okay, so uh, we're going to go to a sh very, very short video and come back. And it's precisely about all the other programs we've done in the last few weeks. Corre video. Uh, all of them are online. If you want to uh, listen to them in uh, ID Academia. You can just go into the YouTube channel. We have all the past programs. Everything is free. Nothing uh, is, uh, you don't have to pay for anything. And you can watch them on demand, including tonight's program that is going to be available in a few hours. And then tomorrow you can share it with your friends or, or watch it again if there was something that you missed or you could come in precisely on time. So now we can go to the questions. For example, there is, uh, uh, Luis, there is one for you. Uh, do you really recommend to just to scoop the, the soft uh, dentin and leaving secondary or infected or affected dentin mm -hmm. beyond the remineralization alone? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is the other hot, topic that we are developing in, 
in the last 20 years, and we are calling it selective caries removal. Um, we were uh, taught in our dental school that we have to remove all caries until we listen this dentin uh, cry. No? The floor, then the floor has to be extremely clean. But right now, the most important thing is to avoid a pulp, pulp exposure. So um, what we have uh, learned in the last uh, time is that we have four different types of dentin. One is a soft dentin, which is carious and it, it's not uh, remineralizable. Second one, it's a leathery type of dentin, which is also carious dentin, and it can be, it's vital and it can be remineralized. Third, we have the firm dentin, which is also carious dentin, and it's uh, indicated to leave it inside the, in the floor, dental floor. And lastly, we have the <coughs> dentin that it's sound dentin. And right now, it's uh, we are uh, taught that uh, it's obsolete to remove all dental caries. Uh, we don't need to remove, in, uh, especially in the dental floor. The dentinal walls have to be extremely clean for addition purposes, but a uh, dental floor has to be uh, spared with that. So, yeah, I believe definitely in selective caries removal. But... What is enough? Um, for example, if you have um, a deep caries lesion, we can even leave the soft dentin there. And there is plenty of articles, uh, scientific literature on that. And if we have a, dent, a, a caries that it's uh, not deep, it's moderate, we can leave this leathery or firm dentin. So... Uh, and what we have found, we, we have found that we have four uh, objectives when we do selective caries removal. In dentin, we sterilize, not completely, but we sterilize the lesion. We remineralize the lesion. And in the pulp, we maintain the vitality of the pulp. And the pulp uh, uh, keeps uh, forming new, new reparative dentin. So it's, uh, it has a much better prognosis than uh, going to the pole, exposing the pole. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Um, Stefan, there's one for you. What, what, man, what uh, produces the pH of the saliva and what happened when the, so the pH drops down? Does it stop protecting us? Yeah, so the pH is very important. And there are several systems installed in saliva that keep the pH at about a neutral value, um, meant to always be ready to neutralize acids. Um, initially, mostly acids that come in through our diet, through our nutrition. So we always eat something that contains acids like um, citrus fruits, um, like oranges or lemons and, and uh also even like, you know, certain salads and vinegar and all that um, contains acids. And as long as we have a healthy saliva, it can protect us from attack of these acids that would immediately start to demineralize um, our teeth. Um, then there is also protection against stomach acid, which is kind of a pretty impressive um experiment that nature offers us for the importance of saliva. So if you can remember an instance where you had to to vomit or to throw up, you may remember that shortly before that happens, you experience a flush of salivary flow. And that is another reflex that is installed by nature to protect our oral cavity against the influx of, uh, of, of stomach acid through that. Um, so what components are responsible for that? So there are um, anorganic components, which are buffer systems, mostly the bicarbonate buffer system that is being um, um, put into saliva from the salivary glands um, 
while the saliva goes through the salivary gland ducts, it gets modified. And interestingly, with increasing salivary flow rate, the salivary buffer capacity goes up, um, which again makes a lot of sense. So if we eat and our salivary flow is stimulated, we have a higher salivary flow. And in addition, we have a higher salivary flow rate. So that's a very smart mechanism uh, made by nature. And then there are also proteins in saliva that uh, serve as buffers, as acid buffers. Um, so um, there are actually, there, in saliva, there are multiple mechanisms that are sometimes redundant. So if one doesn't work, there is always something else that can kind of um, substitute that function, which is another sign for a very important system. You know, you have several sec levels of security and buffering certainly is one of those um, mechanisms. Yeah, this question is for either one of you because it, it talks about caries and it talks about saliva and uh, reflux. Mm. And what's the question? Um, no, no, no. How, the, how are they related? Is it... Uh, you know, we see a lot of uh, acid erosion of teeth with people who have reflux. Yes. And what happened? Is it because during sleep you the the, the flow of sa of saliva lowers, or Luis, you want to comment something? Uh, well, it's not carries what the an acid erosion uh, produ the acid the excess produces it produces erosion. It's a non carries lesion. And even uh, we can find that when little child has reflux or you have anorex and bulimia or those type of things that remove the enamel from the lingual part of the of the tooth. So yeah, it's a big problem. It's where saliva uh, sometimes it's overwhelmed with that acid. Yeah. yeah. Stefan, you want to add something? Yeah, that's. I totally agree with what Luis said. Um, and um, just for the dentists out there, even when you have a seemingly healthy patient and you see erosion, like un very unusual erosion or very unusual um, attrition or abrasion of the occlusal surfaces of teeth, always keep in mind that there might be something wrong with saliva um, because usually these processes do not happen that easily in a healthy mouth where salivary flow and salivary um, composition is intact. So I think we sometimes do not think often enough um, about the functions and dysfunctions of saliva in our dental practice. Michael, you want to add something? You're sitting there so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm good. Thank you. Um, the, the thing with saliva and caries obviously are intimately related to each other. As uh, Stefan showed how lack of saliva, it loses protective mechanism against caries and so on and so forth. One thing that I've always been very curious about, and I've never been able to get a good answer to is, and uh -oh. not to Luis, not to Stefan, you know, we have all these different carriers, um, classification systems. Uh, the Nigel Pitts, uh, IC Dust, there's Canberra and management system and so on and so forth. And Stefan, maybe you can answer here as well, but first to Luis, is there any way any measure you know of that I can measure the, the process and the speed of carries mm -hmm. progression? Um, we were used to use DMFT, no? Uh, now that we are using ICDAS or ICDAS, we are finding more, more and more carries lesions because it involves uh, looking at initial caries lesions. Um, IGDAS also uh, realizes that activity is important. So it's not only evaluating caries as per se, but also activity. 
And the most important thing now in CARES is establishing a individualized carry a monitoring program to, to reverse the balance. And when we have a, a, not an, a balance in the mouth, we have to deal with the individual, I mean the patient level, and to treat the, the disease. So we have to remove that concept of caries, it's a lesion, it's a cavity, and now understanding that it's more uh, of a patient level. And that's sure. the way we are treating that, the problem. Right, but you talk about caries activity. Can we measure yes. that activity? Can we measure that activity and, and make a projection for caries progression? Yeah, so there is a than, protocol. Rather than looking at going from, we know it's in stage one, we know it's stage two, but could I have predicted go from one to two and even measure that? Um, it, we are dealing with arrested caries and um, active caries, and there are protocols to clinically evaluate that, and also how to manage uh, activity. Obviously, um, an active lesion is much more much uh, worry. Uh, we worry much more than than an arrested one. Um, we pediatric dentists we deal with a very active and aggressive lesion that it's a um, how you call um, caries temprana de infancia, early childhood caries, which is considered a rampant caries. Uh, even in two years old, we have uh, completely destroyed the enamel and dentin. So uh, something is happening there that it's not protecting the tooth. So yes, we have protocols to deal with activity, obviously much more uh, worried with the, the active lesion, not the arrested lesion. Stefan, any insight? Yeah, so I do agree with what Luis said uh, for the clinical part. And um, currently I don't think we have what you are wishing for, Michael but maybe the future will bring it because modern molecular biology and biochemistry is able to measure bacterial activity. So what was available so far was just simply counting bacteria and that didn't lead to any prognostic value. So just simply counting the number of streptococcus mutants in the oral cavity can be very misleading. Um, so people with a lot of streptococcus mutants can have very little or almost no carriers, mm -hmm. and others who have very little streptococcus mutants can have a lot of carriers. So that doesn't work. But if you look at bacterial activity, for instance, at the production of lactic acid, which is actually the material, the, the um, metabolite that destroys and demineralizes the enamel layer, that can be measured. And there are publications that do that, and it just hasn't yet hit the market. So um, I'm sure something like that will come, that you will have um, ways of monitoring or even staining with a certain color indicator or something, whether the bacteria in that particular cavity are very active or whether they are dormant. Great, thank you. I have a okay. funny question. Uh, and you can earn a lot of money if you come up with something, of course. So let's do it. I don't know if you are familiar with this tool that we have to measure the, the acid production that Dr. Stefan was mentioning. It's called a 3ID gel from GC. And it stains the biofilm in three colors. The one that it's very new, like some hours, it stains like... A, pink color. Then we have the dark blue that it's like a 48 hours biofilm in, and it's not cariogenic. It's not producing acid. And the one that stays on the, on very, it's a, like a light blue and it's cariogenic. So this product has saccharose on it. So when you place the, the 3 ID gel on the tooth, and it stains immediately because the bacteria starts producing acid. So it's very interesting, that product. Mm -hmm. And we have it in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> from Jap All the way from Japan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Listen, I have a very funny question. And I read it as I, as I read it. As I read it. Uh, 
Wait, my phone just closed. No, hold on. It says, we live in a world where, where it exists a blood donation, semen donation. Will it come a town for a time for saliva donation? <laughs> oh, <laughs> good question. Um, I think perhaps yes, um, because right now we are, we do not have a good saliva substitute. So most everything that is called artificial saliva really doesn't even come close to the physiological functions that we have in natural saliva. So then there are some artificial salivas that um, have ingredients from animal saliva. So there is one product that contains um, mucins from pigs. Now, I have heard from patients that this is... Um, not very much like because it has a very strange taste. So patients don't like to use that. Try there. Yeah. So what about human saliva? Now I think that would also be confronted by skepticism because we are still like you know in this frame of mind that saliva is something disgusting. So I think uh, you know a lot of um, change of mind would have to go on before we would take a saliva donation, um, except maybe that from our best girlfriend, which could work, but um, not from well, another well, person. Some favors, you know. <laughs> yeah, very but there, there are ways, actually, of, um, of sterilizing saliva, which actually we have done uh, several years ago in my laboratory. We have used gamma irradiation to sterilize saliva. So you still have the regular saliva with all its functions, but the bacteria are either dead or inactivated. Um, but still from there, there's a long way to go until you would have a commonly accepted saliva um, substitute that would be accepted by our patients and by the public. Um, so I will, I will say maybe not within the next few years, but uh, sometime in the future, of course, we need to come up with something that um, substitutes saliva like we have substitutes for blood and other body fluids. And uh, maybe by then the biochemical synthesis will allow us to just simply artificially synthesize the important molecules in saliva. So it doesn't have to come from a human origin. We'll be able to um, to make those in the lab. And uh, well, that brings me another question. Is everybody's saliva the same in healthy people? Oh, okay. Another good question. Uh, thank you for that one. Um, no, it's not. And that's a very, very interesting point. Um, so different people have different salivary composition. It's not very different. So if you only look at the major salivary components, almost everybody has those in similar amounts. But if you look a little closer at structure and at the sequence and at the uh, what we call post-translational modifications, which is the decoration with glycans and phosphate groups and things alike, there are great inter-individual differences. And one that is best known to all of us are the blood groups. So many people carry their blood groups also on their salivary mucins. And we all know that we have different blood groups, right? So. Or, or already that is different. And then there are certain people who are called non-secretors who don't have those blood groups in their secretory, secretory fluids. Um, but besides the blood groups, there are lots of other things that are different between different individuals. And I'm reminded of that iceberg that Louis has showed us from Professor Nigel. I think also with saliva, we are just scratching on the tip of an iceberg. Um, we know so little about it. Once we know more, we will be able to translate those differences that you mentioned um, in um, the inter-individual differences in salivary components into diagnostic markers. 
At least that's our hope. Okay. Uh, there is a question that, that I, I'm making one question from many questions, and it's about the rinses that you should use now during the COVID era. Uh, betadine and uh, 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 hypochloric uh, acid water or electrolyte, electrolyte water. Do you have any preference or any research recently that has been done to, to do directly with COVID-19? in particular with the SARS-CoV-2. Well, COVID is a disease, COVID-19 is a yeah. disease. Yeah, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so my advice would be, be very careful with what you put in your oral cavity. Your oral cavity is not the sink of your kitchen. <laughs> okay. So we have presidents who give advice what you should do. <laughs> Don't listen. And uh, let me add something to that one. Be very careful to translate laboratory results yes. to clinical care. Um, yes. You find something very, very different. <laughs> okay. Wait, wait. There are, there are more questions. Um, so you don't recommend rinsing with anything? Well, um, um, particular, the, many people who have been in the program have recommended either bio, biotin for 30 seconds, then gargles uh, slowly for 30 seconds, or do the same with the, with the oxygen peroxide at a very, very small, a very, very small uh, percentage, etc. So you don't recommend anything? Let me make um, a recommendation, Jaime. Uh, I think the best way is to have the patient stop breathing for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that once the virus is there that a disinfection of the mouth will probably not help a lot and to protect against the virus it can only be of a short term protection because very soon these disinfecting um, agents will be flushed away by saliva or by something you eat or drink. So um, I would not encourage oral disinfection just simply for the virus. We also don't do it. There are many, many other virus infections and um, these oral rinses, some of those are antibacterial, but to really kill the virus, you would probably need something more aggressive. And uh, I would be very careful of the harm that is being caused by such agents. Yeah. So I would not want to recommend in the public any of those uh, stronger disinfectants. That would probably work, but then you would probably kill something else. And I was only half, uh, Jaime, I was only half joking but uh, if you have something that could actually disinfect oral cavity and if you have the virus truly beyond the oral cavity actually inside the lungs and as we know this disease can be transmitted by talking by respiratory and so on and so forth so you will actually be you will actually have viruses uh coming back into the oral cavity very quickly uh, by by breathing or talking or so on and so forth so I, I agree with Stefan. You may be able to get a very short-term effect. Uh, the long-term effect for a complete dental procedure may not be there. Let me go to one last video and we'll come back. I still have like, a, a lot of questions, but I'll just make a few and one final comments from all our guests. So uh, let's see this video, please. La línea GAR también ofrece soluciones para quien presenta problemas en las encías. El ya conocido enjuague bucal, Colgate PerioGuard, con clorexidina al 0.12%, ayuda a controlar el nivel de bacterias presentes en boca. Debido a su amplio espectro bactericida, reduce hasta un 99% las bacterias bucales, reduce en un 48% el sangrado gingival y hasta en un 54% la placa bacteriana. 
no contiene alcohol, tiene un sabor agradable a menta, fácil de utilizar y con altísimos estándares de calidad y validación científica que lo distinguen de otras clorexidinas. Al enjuague colgate Periogard se le unen dos nuevos productos que complementan y ayudan al tratamiento de las personas con problemas de encías. La nueva crema dental especializada colgate Periogard con una fórmula a base de zinc que garantiza una acción antibacteriana prolongada que ayuda a prevenir la inflamación de las encías, la formación de placa y sarro dental. Ayuda a prevenir el sangrado gingival hasta en un 66.7%. Puede ser utilizada de forma diaria y prolongada, ya que su principal ingrediente activo se encuentra de forma natural en el cuerpo humano. Y por último, el nuevo cepillo dental especializado Colgate Periogard, de cabeza compacta, mango ergonómico antideslizante y con exclusivas cerdas cónicas Perisoft ultra suaves con puntas de filamentos microfinos, garantizan la eliminación profunda y eficiente de la placa bacteriana sin dañar las encías. Gracias a su cabeza con anatomía diamantada y componente de caucho, evita traumatismos durante el cepillado. Colgate, siempre a la vanguardia del cuidado bucal, presentó Colgate Guard, la ciencia detrás de tu sonrisa. Ok, so maybe if you want to make some final remarks, we'll start with Luis. Well, the, uh, we are living in very exciting times for pediatric dentistry. Uh, we are um, involved in the philosophy of minimal intervention. Uh, we, are, we have many obsessions now. One is uh, to be minimally invasive in what, whatever we do, in, especially in these times, and we are very well prepared for that pediatric dentist. We have many um, available treatments for non-aerosol production. And uh, so whenever any restorative dentist wants to speak to us, we can give a very good advice to you. Thank you. Stefan? Yeah, um, so I think for us dentists, saliva should be what blood is for the medical doctor. So we should, first of all, learn more about it, consider more its functions when we treat our patients, And most importantly of all, keep it in the or in the dental and oral um, research and science field and not give it away. Um, that's our domain. It belongs into the oral cavity. It is unique. It doesn't occur anywhere else in the body. It forms a protective system for the teeth um, that are otherwise not protected by any other protective um, organ, if you compare it to other organs in the body, they all have their protective uh, mechanisms. The teeth don't, but the teeth have uh, remote protective organs, which are our salivary glands that produce saliva and that indirectly protects the teeth. So without saliva, our teeth would not be able to survive. And we should always be aware of that. So no more spitting. <laughs> oh, spit a lot. <laughs> Actually, spitting um, came into disfavor only in the 19th century um, when the early microbiologists found out that many diseases are being um, transmitted through saliva sputum, you know, um, like, you know, Louis Pasteur or Robert Koch in Germany. Um, and then suddenly saliva became something undesired and not wanted and uh, something disgusting. It hasn't been like that before. Um, if you, you know, listen to some indigenous people, they have many uses for saliva. And I've heard, for instance, that also in the South American countries, there's a drink called chicha. Uh, I think maybe you know chicha. It's a fermented drink. Yes, from Peru. and it gets started by the fermentation gets started by someone spitting into the starch containing um, brew, and then in the end you have a nice alcoholic drink. So saliva was not always um, something, you know, um, that people Because didn't like. <laughs> I haven't tried that drink, but I would love to. Michael, any final comments for tonight? Yeah, I think we should have a support group for uh, salivary researchers. Um, uh, I, I think you're 100% right, Stefan. 
many years ago, I wrote a little editorial about it, and I suggested you call it salology, the study about saliva, and mm -hmm. we have a name, then we can have our own domain. We have to create a domain with a name to it that can belong to us somehow. Mm. But I think you're 100% right. Uh, there's so much more to talk about. You know, something, Jaime, we have not talked about, for instance, is the biorhythm of saliva and so on and so forth. And there are many, many other things. So this was wonderful. And I really appreciate all of you to come here and, and share your insight and experience and, and uh, knowledge with us. Uh, I for sure got educated and that's, I take that as a, as a great plus. That, that's one of the reasons I'm doing this to be, to be educated. No, Michael, I have to, I love to thank you because I, I, I now I see that researchers are fun people. <laughs> I had this idea that, you know, they, they would never leave the lab. They would, they would don't, they would never smile. <laughs> and this is very, this is science make easy. And this is what our discussion maybe it's all about. We'll find a way to get all this important research that has strange names for many of us to transform into better practice, into a better treatment for our patients. Uh, I want to thank uh, our sponsors because they, thanks to them, we have this nice production. Uh, a very special thanks to Amic Dental, the American, the uh, Mexican <laughs> Association of Dental Dealers and Manufacturers. Uh, to Colgate Palmolive Mexico, to Dentadec uh, and Ideas Dentales. Thank you very much to the production in Mexico City, uh, Blanca, Miriam, Erin, and Maria. And thank you to all the people in León, Guanajuato from uh, Grupo Produce, which make this uh, special, uh, um, special effects so it looks like we're all sitting down together in a news station. Uh, if we have the following, we also want to thank our uh, a very special thank you for Samantha Arispe. She's uh, our dentist on the other channel. She uh, was translating all night everything into Spanish. And uh, we have a very special program in uh, next week. It's going to be all in Spanish. It's going to be at 9 o'clock. We're going to have uh, Beatriz uh, Aldape, which is a pathologist from, uh, from the National University. Uh, Dr. Mauricio Lisker, a friend of mine, who is a uh, internal medicine and a specialist in liver uh, at a hospital in uh, San Luis, Missouri. And Dr. Alejandro Cardenas, who was already with us uh, a few programs back in, when we were in the afternoons. And we're going to discuss the dichotomy that exists between medicine and dentistry. And maybe COVID is the time to start to uh, understand and respect each other areas and work together towards the patients, uh, uh, our, uh, the, the better well-being of our, of our patients. And in two weeks' time, we're going to have, uh, M Michael, you want to introduce our program in, in two weeks for all our, our American audience? Yes, uh, we're going to actually talk about the microbiome, uh, looking at the, the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to the microbiome. Uh, starting in the mouth and going all the way down to the GI tract. And I think it's going to be very interesting to hear what we can do, what we know and what we don't know and how we can use the microbiome to the ben for the benefit of our patients. And our guest will be? Uh, our guest will be Dr. Venke Bornacke from uh, University of Michigan. Okay. So, uh, well, thank you again. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you to all of you who every Tuesday night uh, sits in, the, in, in your own uh, office or home and watch these interesting programs. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Si te lavas bien las manos, lograrás prevenir con jabón y un buen tallado tu salud hoy queda en ti. Más no olvides que tu boca es otra fuente de Cepillarte bien los dientes